Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word and the gift of fellowship we are able to share together. Please be with me today and speak through me the message you have for us today. Please open our hearts and prepare us to receive it through the Holy Spirit. And I ask this through Jesus' precious name. Amen. And it's funny, uh, as we uh, study in John chapter 4, this message started kind of coming together to me, I don't know, probably a month ago. It's probably more than that. And it's funny, it's very fitting with, with all that we talked about this morning with the Asbury Revival. And uh, Fred, as you shared with us about uh, starting those revival fires and having that spark, it's, it's kind of crazy to think this message was, was kind of developing long before any of this took place. So as we... As I go on today and talk about um, John chapter 4, keep in mind that the Lord is truly speaking to us in these times. I mean, he's, he's got a work that he wants to take part through us, um, and, it's his, and it's his work. But I just wanted to share that before we started, um, so that as you hear the message, um, you could know that it was before any of this revival started happening that this message was, was coming to me. So today in John, I felt led to look at the woman at the well. Most of us know this account because it's taught very frequently. Um, but like all the Bible, it's worth a second look, and it, most of the time a third and a fourth. Uh, the woman at the well has been, uh, been taught many times by pastors and teachers because the Holy Spirit doesn't just give pastors and teachers this message so that we could simply regurgitate it to a group of people. He gives them to the teacher to have them live through the message themselves with the intent of developing who they are for his purpose. And in this message today, we are going to see that my purpose as a teacher and our purpose as the body of Christ is to do the will of the Father. To give everyone a refresher to where we are in the Gospel of John and how Jesus and the disciples got to this well, I can summarize this in the earlier chapters in John. He had started his early ministry by calling the disciples and performing his first miracles, making the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Jesus had just left Jerusalem after celebrating the Passover. I'll see as the... The youth teacher, I'm fighting the urge because last week we just learned about what the Passover was. So I'm fighting the urge to quiz the kids. But if you'll indulge me, Thomas, what was the Passover? Well done. Thank you. You made me proud. <laughs> I'm... Uh, Who's my place here? And while they were in Jerusalem for Passover, Jesus, to put it mildly, uh, he started stirring things up. We have the first cleansing of the temple um, where he was, he was uh, turning over the money changers' trays and tables and he was shooing out all the animals that they were trying to sell. And um, They didn't appreciate those things. You had Nicodemus sneaking in. Nicodemus was a Pharisee that was that snuck in to talk to Jesus in the middle, of, you know, middle of the night because he was kind of wondering what's going on with this guy. Um, and Jesus, at this point, Jesus' ministry was overlapping with John the Baptist, as John the Baptist led the way for Jesus to begin his ministry, his earthly ministry. Um, and now John the Baptist to the Pharisees was just kind of more of a a nut you know, kind of a, a guy who was a charismatic nut that was out there baptizing people. He didn't, they, didn't, they viewed him as somebody to watch, but not, not a real threat. And uh, John told the Pharisees that basically this guy, Jesus, as they saw, he was, his ministry was growing and he needed to de decrease. So um, Jesus was becoming a real threat to the Pharisees, uh, and they were getting rather upset with him. So Jesus, knowing this, uh, knew it was time to kind of get out of there. Um, but he left not out of fear um, of the Pharisees, but out of understanding of his purpose. 
He knew it wasn't his purpose to swing in like a wrecking ball and destroy everything. Even though if you do read the account of uh, him turning, cleansing the temple, you kind of understood that he probably wanted to. He knew that he, that he was there to stir things up just enough to the point to get the point across that things are about to change. So Jesus headed back to Galilee, and as he was going to, as we're going to read, Jesus needed to go through Samaria. And on the surface, that seems pretty unimportant. But for those who understand the politics of the day, um, of the Jews and the Samaritans didn't quite get along. They weren't on the friendliest of terms. This relationship, or lack thereof, stems back many centuries. And to tie this lesson back to the last time I taught up here, the conflict stems uh, back between the split of the northern and the southern kingdom that was a result of Solomon's disobedience that we read about. Well, not about the, the uh, disobedience, but the resulting of that disobedience in Ecclesiastes. The northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrian Empire, and many who lived in that region were displaced by the Assyrian resettlement policy. The Jews that did remain in the northern kingdom intermarried with non-Jews who moved in. The offspring of these people, the Samaritans, were not considered true Jews. The Samaritans, on the other hand, thought that they were the only true Israelites and that they were there to maintain the truth. Now, aren't you glad in this day and age the church has finally figured out that, not to be able to split like that? No. Or I guess, I guess we haven't really figured that one out. They had even built their, own, their very own temple on the mountain where we're going to read about in this chapter. The Samaritans believed that Mount Gerizim was the only true place of worship. But the Jews destroyed this temple in, I, I believe anything that I, I read, it was about 150 years before Jesus' ministry. Uh, the Samaritans, in Jesus' time, still worshipped God where their temple once stood. Now, if you read in the New Testament, you would tend to think that the Samaritans are kind of the, the poor kicking stumps of the Jews. Um, in all the accounts that we see, the good Samaritan, um, this woman at the well. But understand, looking back at their history, uh, they're far from innocent. Um, they've, they actually kind of came around, and if you study the northern kingdom, it, a lot of it stems from their disobedience. They're going after other gods. Um, they kind of put themselves in this place. Um, but that's, Jesus is in the, in the field of reconciliation. He's in the field to bring them to restoration. And as we're going to read here, he does just that. I'm very much oversimplifying this for the sake of time. And as we say in the teen class, I'm trying not to chase it down a rabbit hole. <laughs> but for Jesus to go through Samaria would not be a typical thing to do. Normally the Jews would not go out of their way, or normally the Jews would go out of their way to not have to go through Samaria. Uh, but Jesus did not go out of his way to avoid going through Samaria, but he went straight through uh, to Sychar, um, that is near Mount Gerizim, it's right on the base of it, which is believed to be at the very center of the ongoing conflict. Well, let's get into John chapter 4, and we can uh, break down as to why he needed to go there. So if you all turn with me to John chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made baptized more than disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed into, again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. I can only imagine the disciples, what they were thinking at this moment. They have just come from the cleansing of the temple which you had their kind of the leader of their group flipping over tables and exposing the uh, corrupt business practices of the, of the Jews at the time that were heading up of the temple. Uh, and to make matters worse, John the Baptist, who the Jewish leaders, again, kind of viewed as kind of this passing fad, just said how much more powerful and influential Jesus was going to be. It was already becoming 
apparent that John the Baptist was correct. Jesus was going to be much more powerful and much more influential than John the Baptist ever was supposed to be. I'm sure the disciples were sitting there wondering if they made the right choice in following Jesus with all this turmoil going on and this upheaval, and they were kind of at the center of it, and they were kind of thinking, I don't know if I made the right choice. And then Jesus goes, tells them, okay, let's get out of here. And they were like, oh, whew, let's get out. Said, Finally, you're making sense, Jesus. And he goes, oh, but oh yeah, I got to run through Samaria because I got to see this person about a thing. And they're like, oh no, not again. And these, these four verses show the importance of just why context is so important to, as you read scripture. And so we'll continue on in verse 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the palace of the guard, and the, Jacob, er, the parcel of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus at, on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So it was about noon. That's what it was. So not only did Jesus travel into Samaria, but he basically went to the capital city. So they were walking in a place they didn't want to be, and to make things even better, it's the middle of the day, and the sun is beating down on them. And now, there's uncomfortable, and then there's uncomfortable. And I'm sure at this point, the disciples were, believe it or not, very uncomfortable with their choices at that time. So as we're going to see in the next verses, the dis disciples go into the village to go get meat. And I'm sure at this point, they were more than happy to take a break from Jesus for a moment. They were probably like, sure, Jesus, you just wait here, and for the love of your Father, don't stir up any more trouble. <laughs> they may have been thinking, it's noon. No one in their right mind would be coming to draw water at this time of day. What possible trouble could he get into? Now, parents of young kids... Or parents who have had young kids, you kind of understand where they're at at this point. This guy's nothing but trouble. Let's see how it works out for them. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, it sounds pretty innocuous there. The woman's just like, you know, why are you talking to me? But, but ultimately, she's basically saying to Jesus, what are you asking me for? All the background that we looked at in the dealings with the Samaritans, the fact that it was noon, the hottest part of the day, this woman was in no mood to deal with a hassle by anybody. She was basically saying to Jesus, what are you asking me for? I'm, I'm not dealing with this. Again, there's uncomfortable, and then there is uncomfortable. At this point, this woman, because of her choices, was uncomfortable. Jesus knew what this woman was feeling, so he didn't take offense to her rude comments. He knew what led up to her putting on a tough front. So then he goes on in verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? So Jesus goes on to tell her, if she only knew the gift of God and who was talking to her, how she responds tells me that Jesus spoke in a way that begins to put the woman at ease so she can let her guard down a bit. She responds to him now in a way that is more respectful but still very suspicious. What do you get kids say? She, he was very sus. That's right. So she's saying... Where are you getting this water? And do you think you're better than us? Don't you think if there was better water around here, we would have found it by now? 
But now Jesus is going to cut to the heart of the matter. He knows why this woman has gone out of her way to do laborious tasks at the most inconvenient time of day. And so next he says to her, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. No, Jesus offers this woman an answer that all of us are seeking. The fulfillment and the peace that everyone is after. So, of course, this woman replies how we all would reply. It's just, gimme, gimme, gimme. I want. I'm sure at this point she doesn't actually understand what Jesus is talking about. She doesn't know exactly who he is. All she knows is that someone is offering her what she so desperately wants. In her response, you see it's pretty obvious that this woman came at the time of day to avoid being seen and having to deal with others. And Jesus was offering her a way out, and she wanted it. But God isn't about just helping us out of our troubles in the moment. He's not out of getting us out of our consequences of our sin. He came so that we would be free from the bondage of our sin, to once and for all deal with our sin, So now that this Samaritan woman was drawn to the possibilities of this living water, Jesus was going to tell her something that was going to knock the wind out of her sails. As we continue in verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus unto her said, Thou hast said well, you have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom now you are living with is not your husband. In that saidest thou truly. You see, Jesus didn't want to Jesus didn't want to knock the wind out of her sails. He had to. Jesus wanted to give her that living water and to relieve her of her sin and all the hardships and the shame that came with it. But to do that, he had to deal with the heart of her sin. And to do that, she had to approach him honestly. The Lord wants to give us the true fulfillment in life. He wants us to come to the saving grace through faith. But we have to come to him in truth. It does us no good to hide anything from him because he knows it all anyways. After Jesus asked her a question, I'm sure she dreaded to answer. Jesus goes on to tell her everything she was dreading to tell him. At this point, I'm sure this woman doesn't know what to think. Probably a mixture of fear amazement, and a little bit of why me. She was also thinking, if this guy's a prophet, I'm going to get some answers. Now, I'm from Mount Morris, and I I married into an Italian family, so I know a little bit about sassy women. (laughs) (laughs) See, Brad's not laughing because he's in arm's reach. Neither is Andy. (laughs) But this woman was... She wanted nothing to do with it. But she got to a point and was like, fine, if I'm going to have to deal with this, I'm getting some answers. So she kind of gave him a little uh, sass back. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what of. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman saith unto him, I know us the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speaketh unto thee am he. I sit there and think, 
those are probably some of the most powerful words in the Bible. I that speaketh unto thee am he. It's apparent here that the woman had some previous knowledge of the scriptures. She knew about the coming Messiah, and she was aware of the issues between the Samaritans and the Jews, and where worship was to take place. So this woman takes the opportunity in her spunk to get some answers about who's right. And God answers her in a very powerful answer that the Savior is coming from the Jews, but it will usher in a new worship in spirit and in truth. You see, this happens when you follow the traditions of men and not follow the true and living God. You find yourself more concerned with the physical actions of worship, like where the location is, whether the worship music is too lively or not lively enough, whether the message is too long, too short, whether the building is big and grand enough, or whether it's too ornate. You find yourself in this woman's shoes, or sandals if you will, and you don't even really know who or what you are worshiping. And the Savior is coming from the Jews, but it is those that worship in spirit, the core of who they are, that will truly worship God. It's not about where you worship. It's not about what your group you're in or these things that don't make your worship more meaningful or pleasing to God, as Jesus puts it. God is spirit. He is not bound by physical location. The reason for the temple wasn't so that God had a place to be. It wasn't that he needed somewhere that he had to be. It was that because of our sin, we couldn't be in the presence of God. And God needed a way for us to sacrifice continually to atone for our sins. Now, Jesus is that atonement, which allows us to be the very indwelling spirit of God within us, poured out at Pentecost. But like the woman at the well, you have to approach in truth. This is a hard one to define because I want to make it clear it does not mean that you have to be perfect. Before you can approach God, it doesn't mean that you have to confess to man everything that you've ever done or the Holy Spirit will not dwell within you. It is by grace we are saved through the work of the cross and far be it from me to add anything to that. Jesus is saying that faith in Jesus does not Jesus is saying that faith in Jesus does have to be sincere, though. Part of the problem with the Samaritans was that they worshipped God alongside the pagan gods of the day, having assimilated with their other cultures. We can't approach Jesus as a way to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven in reconciliation with God. The fact that Jesus went after the woman says to me that he knew her heart. He knew her actions were a result of the misrepresentations she was given by man as to who God really was. She had been seeking fulfillment in failed relationship after failed relationship. And by this point, she had given up on the institution of marriage altogether. She had given up on the system that had broken governing over these marriages. I'm sure she was living in a, a, a life that left her longing for something more, something meaningful, and she was going after everything in the world had to offer. But each time, she would find brokenness and have to go back to man's well to try and quench the thirst for meaning that only God can fill. Jesus purposefully sought her out to restore her. God obviously viewed the Samaritans as his people. The reason I believe this is that after he cleansed the Jewish temple, he then heads to the Samaritan city, the place of worship of the prodigal son, if you will. Jesus knew this woman was a product of a broken system. He understood that even though she had given up on the system, she was, in her heart, still waiting for the Savior. And he revealed to himself, he revealed himself to her in no uncertain terms. I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with this woman. Yet no man saidest, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, 
Come and see this man which I told me all things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Basically brought him something to eat. Upon hearing this, the Messiah speak directly to her. The Samaritan woman left which she was using to get water and left to go tell all the others in the city that she had found the Christ. She has found that fulfillment. She will thirst no more. She had no more need of the devices she was using to fill the void that only God can. The disciples couldn't understand why Jesus would be talking to this woman. And let's remember, when the disciples left Jesus at the well, it was because it was it said in verse 6 that he was wearied with his journey. Some think this verse shows the humanity of Christ and that he would get tired and hungry, like any person. And I don't want to discredit that. Um, Jesus was fully man. Uh, but looking at the situation, I feel that the further Jesus traveled through the heavy, heavier the brokenness became, between the once unified nation of Israel weighed upon him. The only nourishment that would suffice was the reconciliation of those that were lost. And the disciples, like most times, just didn't get it. So as we read on, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of the that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that wherein ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. Jesus knew the state of man. He knew that the very thing he established that was there for the blessing has now become a burden. In Genesis 12, 2 and 3, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read it. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Jesus meet the very thing that gives him nourishment. He outlines for us in John 4, 34. It is to do the will of the Father, and which is to seek and save the lost. Ultimately, Jesus gave his life so that we may become the body of Christ. And our meat, where the body gets its nourishment, needs to be the will of the Father. It is the only thing that will give any real nourishment. The only thing that will bring any relief to the weariness I think most of us have been feeling lately. The disciples went into the city to get their own meat. To bring their own works, they brought food so that Christ would be alleviated of his body's weariness. How often do we think, if only we had a better equipment for the worship team, or if maybe if we had more comfortable chairs. What if we had a really awesome VBS program? All these things are good, but ultimately it is the meat that will nourish the body of Christ. We are saved for a purpose, and anyone who teaches health and wealth and that it's all about you is missing the point. As we see here in Jesus set in motion a revival in Samaria, I'm sure as the disciples were arguing about where Jesus get his food, Jesus was watching as the city was coming to see what this woman told them about. Jesus was going to show the disciples just what it meant to be the church. As the lost were coming to Christ, it was the disciples' job to bring in the harvest. We need to be ready to receive the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit has sowed in the hearts of those around us. To be ready to reap the harvest of souls into the kingdom. 
And those who planted and those who gathered are going to rejoice, not only here on earth, but ultimately in our eternal reward in heaven together. And what a glorious day that will be. Amen. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him, and he would tarry with him. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The woman went back to the city and went back to the very people she was trying to avoid. And some, after seeing this miraculous change in this woman, believed simply by her message that she had found the Christ and the changes that they saw in her. While others believed after seeing him for themselves. Now ultimately our job of the church is to point people to Christ and be an example of who he is. That is the meat that will nourish us like nothing else can and give us the strength that no one else can explain. All the work we do here at this church, while at least I'll speak for myself, is not out of an obligation or need. I do not, I do, not do it for personal praise or the feeling of achievement, although I do appreciate the thanks, but that's not why I'm, I'm doing this. That's not why I put forth the effort. I continue working because when I read this account, I remember I was there. That was once me. It was within the body of believers, much like this one, who were faithfully sharing the gospel where Jesus chose to meet me. We do not do the saving, only Jesus can. But we all have an opportunity to take part in reaching the lost, whether by sowing or reaping or maybe even both. I am sure that all the disciples went through I'm sure that all what the disciples went through up to this point became abundantly clear that it was worth it. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for the gift that is to be a part of your will. That you pour we ask that you pour out your spirit beyond measure to those in our lives who are lost and hurting. I pray you spark a great revival in your own in this area so that we can take part. Let us see what your disciples have seen, Lord, not for our gain or accomplishment, Lord, but for your glory. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.